Good morning, Willand. Oh, come on. This is 1055. Come on, you guys should be alive, right? Good morning, Willand. Maybe I have to say buenos dias. Maybe that would be better. I don't know. My name is Daniel Elias. I'm one of the pastors here at Woodland, and it's my privilege to share God's word with you today. It is always a great privilege, and yet it's also a great responsibility when we bring the word of God, because we're not speaking just off the cuff, if you will, but we're speaking as God, we're speaking through us. Amen? So um, I want to encourage you by, uh, to, to use your Bible or your device, if you have it in your telephone, because... Um, it's great when you can see it for yourself. You know that there are people who don't have the privilege to read God's Word. And so every time we, we get the opportunity, we should take advantage of it. Uh, we're going to be at, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 6. The Word of God tells us there. Uh, it's on the screens too if you want to follow along, if you don't have a Bible or... These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey, then all will go well with you. And you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we depend on you right now. What we don't know, will you please teach us? What we do not have, Lord, give us what we are not. Make us for the sake of your kingdom and your glory, we pray. Amen. So a couple months ago when Pastor Tim asked me to, to um, you know, preach, um, in his absence, um, I began to pray, Lord, what would you have me to share? We as associate pastors, we don't get to preach often, which is okay, but, but what I'm saying is you, you don't want to just speak anything. You want to bring what God has in store for this particular uh, community of believers. So the word that kept on coming back was obedience. Will you say that with me? Yes, I like participation. I don't know. I, I, it's kind of a weird thing. It's not like a Latino thing. It just... Uh, it's, it's, I like people to interact with me. So obedience. Now, I just said that, and some people immediately go, oh, that's a negative connotation right there, right? Oh, this guy is going to tell us what to do now. Children obey their parents. That's a different sermon, so we're not going to address that one. It's going to be included there somehow. However, it's a very important word for us all. Don't you agree? We all have to deal with it. We have to obey the law, or you may end up in jail, or you may get a ticket, right? Some of you former officers, I see a brother here just not nodding, and, and yeah, we have to do it. We got to do what the boss says, or soon you will be looking for another job, right? That's just part of, part of life. You get the point. Obedience is a very important word, not only in theory, but in practice. And we all love the, to enjoy the benefits of obedience, and, and yet most of the time we want to bypass or forego what is expected of us. When, when, I, when I was a little kid, I grew up with this verse, Deleitate a sí mismo en Jehová, and he will give you the desires. Oh no, y él te dará las peticiones de tu corazón. I went from one language to the other. Um, and that's what it is here. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know what I, what I did very, very readily, very quickly as a, as a young child, I would be very quick to give God all the desires of my heart. I had a list. I mean, it was right there. And somehow I bypassed this. Oh, the lighting. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll go to church. I'll do this. I, you know, do for God. Let me tell you, my friends, this is it's not to be switched around, but it, the order needs to be kept up. Delight yourself in God. Later on, I have learned throughout my spiritual journey that delighting in God is enjoy Him. Will you get to know Him? We have a cup of coffee with him every, every day, a long cup of coffee. That's what it is. So it's as simple as that. Delight, enjoy God, and guess what? You're going to get to know his heart. You're going to get to see for who he, he really is, and then his heart becomes your heart. So when the desires of your heart come, they are the desires of God's heart. Do you see how it works? It's as simple as that. Now, it reminds me of that teenage boy and my middle schoolers left here, uh, but they could have benefited from this. 
This boy was 16 years old and said to his dad, Dad, when I turn 16 and get my driver's license, can I drive your car? His dad looked at him and said, Son, driving takes a lot of maturity, and first, you must prove you're responsible enough. And there are, th there are three things that you can show that, Dad, bring up your grades, read your Bible, and get that haircut for heaven's sakes. It looks hideous. You know how, how parents are with their kids, and I know we all go through those moments. That's okay. The son began to the task of fulfilling his father's requirements, knowing that the last one might be a little bit impossible, right? The haircut. When his grace came out, he returned to his dad with a big smile. Look, dad. Oh, he was all proud. All A's and B's on my report card. Now, can I drive the car? Very good, son. You are one third of the way there. Have you been reading your Bible? As a matter of fact, yes, I have. Every day. Well, great, son. You're two thirds of the way there. Now, when are you getting your haircut? He said. The son, thinking he could outsmart his dad, responded, Well, I don't see why I should get my haircut to drive the car. Jesus had long hair, didn't he? <laughs> the father looked at him, at his son, and said, That's right, son. And Jesus walked everywhere he went. We are like the sun. We want the blessing to drive the car, right? We want to get behind the, the throne there. And we're just so... And yet we neglect the responsibility. Sometimes it's that we are partly obedient. We, at least we did something. In order to enjoy the privilege in driving our own set of wheels, we need to do it all. We need to follow him. We need to follow and be obedient. So we're going to camp in that particular verse, actually, Deuteronomy 6.2. Can you read it with me, please, right here? It's on the screens. Can you put it? Yeah, there we go. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Very simple. I call it, this is a very simple formula of a, to a blessed life. Hence the title of this, uh, of this message. The key to a blessed life is found in that verse, and I have put it there as H plus O equals blessed life. And the H stands for a high view of God. Do you see that in the first part of the verse? You must fear God, it says. Now, fear, many people misunderstand that. They think, of, Ooh, no, we don't want to have to do anything with God. No, my friends, you need to have a healthy view of God. You will have a healthy fear of God because He is God. After all, the last time I checked, he's the only one true God. The one with the capital G, right? The one above all other gods. Those are found in Scripture. There is a phrase that I love, it, especially in the book of Isaiah. that says, apart from me, God says, there is no other. Will you say that? No other. No other. It's only one God. Many of us, unfortunately, through life circumstances, we have been marred you know, with, our, with a picture of God. We think, oh, I can fit him in a box. I can put him on a shelf. I can, like a little genie, I just come and, you know, look for him anytime that he, I need something from him, and I'm sure he's a nice guy. He's going to take care of me. My friends, we just have a convenient God in many cases. I know I'm guilty of that. But I have learned that this God, the God with the capital G, is the one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who, yes, even though he was a great and mighty God, he also called us friends. Remember Jesus said, now, nah, you're no longer my disciples. I want to call you my friends, he said. So, yes, we can have a friend-to-friend friend -friend relationship with God, but we need to have that healthy view and perspective of who he still is. So when he, when he says something or he calls the shots, we follow, right? We follow. Unquestionably, we follow. Every time I think of my relationship with the Lord, and when things especially are not going well, I turn to the book of Job. I read two chapters in the book of Job that always make me grateful as to where I'm at. Have you ever, do you know the story of Job? J-O-B, oh, poor guy. If you ever feel depressed, just read the book and you'll feel better. Trust me on that. <laughs> read that book. Man, that man had it coming to him, and he felt like it was, it was never going to stop. The, he was a man that was blameless, upright, feared God, and shunned evil. Those are the four characteristics of this man, the way that he's described in the, in the book of Job at the beginning. And yet God tested Job 
And guess what? Took away his possessions. He allowed the enemy, Satan, you know, to do his thing, but he loves to mess up people's lives. Took away his possessions, his children, his health. Even he cursed the day he died. I dare to say he was suicidal, in my opinion, the way I read it. And, in, and after a series of circumstances, he was getting all down, my friends. He even actually had friends, supposed friends, come and encourage him. Guess what? They, they were not much help. But after all that moping, all that complaining, God heard the prayer of Job. And this is what he said. Again, if you want to read it later on, please do Job 38 and 39. Wonderful chapters. Just to give you a glimpse. You see what he's, how he starts? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Have you ever given orders to the morning? Or shown the dawn its place? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? And I love when it gets very Floridian here. Because he says, who gives the ibis wisdom? And gives the rooster understanding? And I got so intrigued by this chapter that I thought, man, I got to just share this, this fountain of knowledge about the ostrich. Do you know the ostrich is described in the Bible? has a six verses in the Bible. Right there, it talks about the ostrich. The winds of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings of, uh, and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. As I was looking at this passage, a commentator said the following about this passage that I just read, the, the ostrich passage. Here is a wonderfully stupid creature, he says, an ostrich, with wings but unable to fly, laying eggs on the ground. Not endowed with wisdom, as it was described. Yet she can run fast, my friends. Strange things in the world, Job. If you cannot understand the oddity of the ostrich, what chance do you have to understand the innermost moral workings of the universe? End of quote. God is God. And you know, Job's response, which is in chapter 40, says, then Job answered the Lord, and look at what he said. Look, look at this. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. What a picture. Have you ever had to do that with God in your life? I know I have. When we think we know better than God. I'm sure I can give you some insight, Lord, so you can, you know, deliver here for me but put my hand in my mouth. You're God. I'm not. It's hard. Because he's the same God who parted the Red Sea in Exodus 15. This is, I, I just love, the, the Bible has such a beauty in describing the metaphors, the pictures here. He says, by the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, he says, about the parting of the Red Sea. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congeal in the heart of the sea. He is the same God, my friends, who in Psalm 30, 139 says that he formed us in our mother's womb. He knows our thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on our tongue, he knows it completely. Wow. Scary, but wow, right? Because sometimes we start thinking, wow. We sometimes don't even think. Maybe God is not listening to this one. He already knows he already knows. And I believe what has happened sometimes to Christians in general, not only in America, but in throughout the whole world, is that we don't have a healthy view of God. We think he's our buddy. And he is our friend. I'm not saying he cannot be your friend. He cares for you. He listens to you as a friend. But when he, he needs to call us to uncharted territory, we need to just follow and obey. Right? As a matter of fact, that's where we're going with this. You see that? 
before such God, the one who makes kings rise and fall because he's the king of the universe, the one that Isaiah said, my ways are not your ways, nor your thoughts my thoughts. Because I'm different. I'm God, you're not. My friends, to that God, we need to do no other thing but to obey. Can I hear an amen? When you have a healthy view of God, you don't question him. A lot of us, I know I speak for myself, because as I said, every time we preach here, you got to be filtered through us preachers. <laughs> the past couple of years, I've been questioning God. And God has said, Daniel, let's go back to Obedience 101. And Daniel has had to learn and learn and learn. But I get closer and closer to him during that journey. I get to know him. I know his heart. I know he cares for me. I know he has the best interest for me. So before this such beautiful, wonderful, mighty God, all I can do is but obey. That's the next word. That's the next part of the equation here. The formula. Oh, for obey. No other choice but obey. When I say the word obedience, as I said, it turns people off. Oh, kids got to obey their parents. Of course, that's logical, right? Can I hear an amen, parents? Yes. Oh, come on. Yes, right? Am I, am I too strict? I think I'm too strict or something like that. You got I mean, you, you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta just expect that from, you know, from these kids. After all, you're, you're, you're willing to give your life for them, right? I'm looking at this one that is falling asleep there. I know, but sometimes I tell you it's a drag. Maybe we're too strict. Maybe we, the term again has negative connotations or positive in some cases because it's good to be obedient and to instill obedience in your kids. Obedi obedience is a big deal to us as parents. Obedience is a really big deal for God. Do you think so? I, I believe so. Why? Because he says it in Scripture. You must obey. I mean, we read all those texts so far. Because he is our Heavenly Father, our Savior, our Lord. You know, when we think about the word Lord, it means master. Master is you do whatever he says. Whatever he says goes. The Bible actually addresses this, this obedience 170 times. And those are the times where he actually just used it as a verb. But there are other times where it's implied there in other you know, parts of the sentences. But obedience is mentioned 170 times. So why should we obey God? Let's get into that very quickly. Out of obligation? No. Uh, because we have to? No. Because he commands it. Remember what he said at the very beginning? of that text and it's throughout scripture because he commands it and as we have seen we have gotten a glimpse through the book of Job he deserves it my friend can I hear an amen? amen he deserves it he deserves it if anybody deserves it sometimes we haven't had maybe the greatest parents or whatever we don't you know we don't feel like obeying because they haven't been a good example or something that's a whole other story that's between you and the Lord but actually the Bible tells us to honor our parents regardless okay that's a whole other subject but when it comes to God he's a perfect father he has always been good to, you, to us, to me. So I need to obey. I need to obey. I need to obey. And, and, and I think we need to graduate from command, from deserving to because I love him. I obey because I love him. Have you, are you there? Anybody here? We don't do it because, oh, God, again, oh, goodness. No. Jesus said, if you love me, what? You will obey my commandments. My commands. Another part in First John says, loving God means keeping His command, commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Have you ever thought about it? What used to be, look at me, look at me here. When you used to be younger, right, younger, you used to think of some stuff, oh man, that's a drag. Now you're a little bit older, a little bit older, a little bit older, and what happened? Those same commands from back there, they become easier here. Isn't that true? Because we also have this relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we understand that He, he puts those command, commandments there for a reason. So that we can benefit from them. Right? As a matter of fact, the way that is, is put here in a, in a, in a quote that I, I, is one of my favorite preachers, Alistair Bay. He said the following. Religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. But look at the difference here. Christianity says, I am accepted. Therefore, I obey. Do you see that? That's, that's, that is the proper perspective. 
You see, Jesus came and died for us, all wretched sinners. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. So we were already accepted at the cross. He was compelled to die for us because he loved us so much. So we already accepted. So we don't have to do it to get brownie points with God. We just have to do it because we love him. We please him. And there is a joy when we do what God says for us to do. There's such a joy. I don't know about you, but there are times that I just catch myself seriously just smiling to myself. Probably people think that I'm weird or something like that. But I'm serious. I'm serious. In the middle of, like, whatever. Like, this is what it is. The blessed life of following Jesus, of being joyful in the moment, and realize that he commands it, deserves it, but he has a personal relationship with me, and because of that, I'm going to love him by doing what's best for me. You see that progression? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's the way it was meant to be. It's best for us. Therefore, you have the high view of God. You have that obedience. You get a blessed life. And who doesn't want a blessed life? I didn't say that earlier, but blessed in the dictionary is actually defined as a a heavenly bliss. Heavenly bliss. So can you start having a heavenly bliss here on earth? You don't have to get to heaven to start enjoying heaven. Does that make sense? You can start enjoying the kind of life that Jesus wants for us here on earth. And I just want to encourage you, brothers. We need to pursue that with all of our heart. Now, how does that look? You're going to tell me, Daniel, how does that happen? Because I don't know. I've been struggling lately. Let me tell you. The Bible tells us very clearly through different characters of the Bible. People. These are real people like Abraham. Will you say Abraham with me? Do you know who Father Abraham had many sons? You know, he was a big patriarch of the people of Israel, right? God called him, chose him for such thing. That was a big responsibility. In Genesis 12, 1, it said, God asked Abraham to give up his past. You know why he said that? Because the Lord told him, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. How many of us have made a move like that where you kind of leave your family all your traditions, and you have moved to Florida, right? Okay, maybe not. Not many of you. <laughs> I have had to do that a couple times. Actually, when I left my native land of El Salvador, I came, I always say that as a testimony, I came with two suitcases and a viola to study in the United States. I left everything behind. I have gone back and visit, but do I want to go back? No. <laughs> Just because it's, you know, I have gotten, you know, my, my place is here. God has called me here. And, and, but, but, but my point is the following. We, we leave whatever is behind. Abram said, pack up your bags, go. Address to be an ours. And then later on, we find out in Genesis 22, remember? The promise that God gave to Abram at that time and then to Abraham. Because Abraham means the father of many, the exalted father of many. He gave that promise that he will make him the father of a big nation, Israel. And he will be so numerous as the stars in the skies, as the sand in the seashore. We can relate to that. Let me tell you, my friends, he asked him to give up his future. That is a feeling there. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Look at that. There goes God again, testing. God does some testing. You know, tests, tests are good every so often, right? They're good because they refine us. He said to him, Abraham, do you know the only words that in that passage Abraham said to God was, here I am. Will you say that with me? Here I am. When was the last time you said that to God? Just that. Here I am. Just impressed that on my heart. That, that, that's all that he said. Abraham answered, here I am, Lord. And you know what he said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. And let me tell you, Abraham obeyed, no questions asked. We're going to unpack this a little bit more. But Abraham was not like that. As a matter of fact, I gave you those three passages, we're not going to take too long to go through them. But here, in the past, between Genesis 12 and Genesis 22, Abraham had a couple times where he would will and deal with God, I call it. 
he would argue with God. He even laughed at God one time. In the first occasion, it was when he said in, in chapter 15, 2 and 3, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Remember when Sarah kind of wanted to fix the thing? Okay, just go, you know, uh, uh, maid servant, and we'll have an heir. The second occasion, 17, 17, and, and 18, he says, After Abraham laughed at God, look at that, that's what it is, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And I don't know how many of you have had children later in life. I thought we were old when we were 38 when we had our first joy, you know, our daughter. This was 90 and 100. So talk about God can deliver. He can deliver. Yes. But guess what? I mean, here they have that relationship to say, God, hey, come on, what's going on here? I'm old. <laughs> are you, are you, you have a great sense of humor. Chapter 18, verse 16 through 33, when the three visitors came from God to say, basically, we're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, so you better be ready. And guess what? The compassionate heart of Abraham, he started willing and dealing with God. Hey, how about we have 50, 40, you know, and he brings it down to 10. But now, in Genesis 22, all that Abraham said is, here I am. Here I am. Now, the mandate, if you will, the command was pretty difficult because he was to go take your son and sacrifice him. Actually, it was a common practice in some pagan cultures there at that time, so it might not have been completely a, a surprise to him. But the fact that you have to do that, what? Are you sure, God? This is the God of the promise, remember? It is through Isaac that the whole big nation that you talked about. But he just simply obeyed. He went for it. So Abraham's obedience in a couple of sentences here real quick. A questionable is the first fill in there. No buts. It was immediate. Look at what it says in verse 3. Early the next morning, if you're following your Bibles there. Early the next morning. I love it when people are not procrastinators. I'm not a procrastinator. How many of you are procrastinators here? Raise your hand. I'm praying for you. Yeah, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> but my point is, Abraham knew who he was dealing with, God Almighty. He went for it. Early next morning. He didn't say, ah, we'll live around noon. No, early next morning. And also, he was thorough. Why I think that he was thorough? Look at what it says in verse 3. Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had caught enough wood for the burnt offering, don't miss that. He set out for the place God had told him about. He was a boy scout. He wanted to make sure that everything was prepared so he didn't have the excuse about, about oh, I'm sorry, we, we cannot do this because of the, the, there's not enough material. And number four, Abraham's obedience was resting on God's character and his promises. You know that when they got to the point that they had to leave the servants there, he said to the servants, and the, I think the scripture is there. Can we go to the next one, please, real quick? We will worship. That's what he said. Abraham said to the servants, we will worship, and then we will come back to you. We. No me, no I will come back, but we will come back. He was resting on God and his promises that he will, he will provide. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what he said. Number five, he trusted God's provision. When Isaac, can you picture yourself, some of you that dads who have a son, think about it. You're asked to do this, such a task. You're up the mountain. You're getting ready for the, for the, for the sacrifice. And here we have eight-year-old Isaac. Daddy. Daddy. Um, I know we're getting all this ready, but where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? I mean, we just read through these passages, but this was real time. It was happening right there and then. And you know what he said? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. Those are powerful words. How many times you and I as parents have been able to witness and say that to our own children or grandchildren? God himself will provide. My friends, I don't have to tell you anything you know how life can be difficult. You will have storms in life. But let me tell you, we have a God that will always show up. Can I hear an amen? amen? He will always show up. He will always provide. 
That's why we sing songs like that. That's why I love the song. You always provide every season of our life. Thank you, Father, we trust in you. You always provide every moment, every time. Thank you, Father, we trust in you. So when we don't have it in us, songs can help us just to propel thanksgiving and faith and saying, God, you will do it again. You did it for Abraham. You did it for whoever in your family. You can do it for me. Amen? He can provide. I, I, I mean, the older I get, the more I am convinced that he owns, like the Bible says, and that's the big famous verse, he owns the, what is it? The hill of a, the cattle of a thousand hills or whatever that, that expression is. I always get it all messed up. He owns everything. He owns everything. Actually, for mission trips, every time I say to the mission team that I lead, I said, when it comes to the monies, I am no worry. Because if God wants us there, he will provide. I believe it to the core. So whether it's $15,000, $30,000, or we want to be ambitious and be a, do a big thing for God, he's going to provide. And guess what? Glenn, hasn't he always delivered? He's always delivered. He always knows how much more we're going to need. Right? So we say, oh, $15,000. Guess what? God provided $17,000 or $19,000 the first time we went to the Navajo Nation. Oh, we've got to be a little bit more, you know, uh, we need to do this other project, we'll do $30,000, and guess what? The Lord provide $32,000. God always provides. Now, we're talking only about financial or, or uh, material things, but He only provide. He provided what Abraham needed here. He provided, look at what it says, when, after Abraham gets stopped by the angel of the Lord, not to kill Isaac and provide a ram, Abraham calls that place the Lord will provide. Number six, we got to move on here. God-fearing. Abraham's obedience was God-fearing. Look at this. Don't miss this. Do not do anything to him. This is when, look at that. Isaac was, I mean, Abraham was about to kill his son. Guess what? The angel stops him. And he said, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Do you see that there? Fear. High view of God. Know him for who he is. It's right there. Beautiful. It's beautiful. God, God rewards that. And let me tell you, because of that, there was a blessing there. there was, he was blessed by God. Look at what he says in verse 17. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. And through your offspring, all nations of earth will be blessed. Why? Because you have, there is a word, fear God, fear of God, obedience, obey Obey me. What a blessing. Because one man's simple yet crucial act of obedience. On the other hand, we have exhibit B, and that is Jonah. Everybody say Jonah. But can you, can you say it like Jonah? Yeah. Poor Jonah. He gets a bad rap. But we all are Jonah sometimes. You know that? Do you know that we're all Jonah sometimes? At times? If we were to summarize the life of Jonah, I know they want me to finish quickly because they put this very quickly. So that's a good way. Give a lot of material and then they will speed it up. You know what I mean? Then they will be good. Jonah ran. Jonah pray. Jonah obey. Jonah learn. That's the book of Jonah right there. Just right there. That's all he did. God asked him. He was a prophet. What a prophet does? He, just, he goes is God's messenger. He goes and speaks on behalf of God. And he said, okay, Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh. Tell them how wicked they are. And because of that, Jonah said, whoo, the other way, right? He ran the other way. He disobeyed God. Jonah's response was disobedience. He ran the other way. And I tell you, my friends, I believe at that moment, Jonah had a distorted view of God. Even, kind of revelation to me was that even prophets, even pastors, even leaders, even mature seasoned Christians can have a distorted view of God. We have a cloud, maybe kind of, you know, covering for who God really is. 
in figure of speech there. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes we, we get this thing like, oh, no, God, God wants me to do it. No, I'll do the other. No. Maybe he had excuses like, oh, they are so wicked, they're going to kill me. Or maybe oh, it takes about a month's journey to get there. The disobedience is not spelled out here in the Scripture, but in chapter 4, look at that. In chapter 4, actually comes out, and look at what he says. This is Jonah speaking to God. I don't know if I would do it. Jonah, poor advice, I mean, uh, bad advice, too late. Isn't this what I said, Lord? Look at this, Jonah, talking to God, the God Almighty. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. He was justifying his disobedience. Do you see that there? I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That's why I didn't want to go. We can very easily justify our disobedience even before God Almighty, the one who knows, even before a word is on our tongue. But Jonah opted out for a long detour that took him through a 4D experience in the belly of a great fish. Yes, number two says that Jonah in that fish in that belly, he cannot refocus his view of God. Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes we got to be at the bottom, hit rock bottom, to realize who God really is. Amen? Yeah. Look, if you, I'm serious, read. This is one of the most beautiful prayers. Sometimes we neglect the second chapter in the book of Jonah. He says, you hurl me into the depths, into the very hearts of the sea, and the currents swirl about me. I mean, he was drowning, probably. He, that was his feeling. Look at verse 6. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. That's a beautiful expression, isn't it? How many of you have felt that way? When God has brought you up from the pit, you were so bottom down there that he brought you up. Look at what it says in verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. I think he was preaching to himself, don't you think, when he said that? And then in verse 9, that's what I have there, I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And I believe, this is my pure speculation, that he was talking about not only about what he was going to go tell the people of Nineveh, but he was actually saying, you're going to deliver me here, Lord. You're going to spew me out of here and get me out of this mess. I think it was a personal experience. He would just see in there side by side that this was not only about the people of Nineveh, but it was about himself. In Jonah, my friends, yes, he finally obeyed the Lord. In chapter 3, verse 3 says, Now Nineveh was a very large city and took three days to go through it. Do you think Jonah did the job half done? I think he took the three days to go and preach the gospel of repentance. Repentance. Turn away. You're going... To, to, to destruction. But when Jonah obeyed, my friends, God's blessings, those are the feelings there, pour over the whole city. This is a beautiful story. I tell you, you got to go read it because it's, it's wonderful. This, it says there that 3 verse 5 says, the Ninevites believe God. These are the wicked people. Hello? These are the wicked people that Jonah had just already thrown the towel for them. But they believe God. It says there. Look at number two. Number two there in the, the, the next verse, actually 3, 6. It says, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself from, with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That, my friend, is an expression of repentance. And he was the big kahuna, the big king of Nineveh, the king of the wicked people. And then he even issued a decree, let everyone, look at this, let everyone call, not casually, whenever you want, urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Look at that. This is a pagan king. And he says, who knows? A little bit of faith from that pagan king. Who knows God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. I wish our president, president of the United States or any nation will pray that, will decree that. Wouldn't that be a revival in our land? And don't ever give up. Be Democrat or Republican, don't ever give up on people. Because God can get our attention somehow. And the unthinkable can happen. It happened here in the days of Jonah. That's what I pray. When I saw that prayer, it's like, man, I'm going to send it to our current president there. And see if he will consider. Hey, 
You never know. What a blessing. What a blessing it was. Why? Because one man's initial disobedience, which in turn, through a series of supernatural circumstances, became a crucial, obedient servant that saved 120,000 people. We're not talking some change here. Oh, 5, 10, 100, 300. 120,000 people. Why? Because he finally got the heart of God. He got the heart of God. Why? Jesus said, I have come to seek and save that which was lost. And he doesn't want anybody to perish. Do you know that? I don't know if you're here and you don't know this God thing or Jesus. You're trying to figure us out, if you will, or the gospel out. Let me tell you, he doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to go to the place of torment for eternity. That's the same God of Jonah who now is working in us today here in our midst, and he wants everybody to be saved, to come to the knowledge of Jesus. Now, many of us, though, go through life not fully obeying God. We're beginning to land here, so we're almost done. We're not going to be the, the uh, Methodist to the, to the buffet or something, whatever you guys are doing. I know. Anyhow, bad joke, bad joke. Um, but I tell you something, we're going to land this here quickly. How many of us consider that just doing something partially is still okay? In other words, partial obedience is disobedience. That was a big slap on the face on, uh, for me many years ago when a, a, a friend of mine told me that, you know, Daniel, partial obedience is disobedience. And kind of, I got thinking like, yeah, it's true. Well, what about this one? Delay obedience is disobedience. The Lord really got a hold of me. He has a sense of humor. You know, when we start having kids and then the kids will not do it right away. <laughs> and then come on, didn't I say to pick up this? Blah, 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 you know, whatever you're requesting your, your child. And then God put a big mirror on my face and said, Daniel, that's exactly what you're doing to me right now. You're putting it off from the mouth of babes because I learned my lesson. God says, we do. We obey. If we only knew the sheer goodness of what God is calling us and inviting us into, my friends, we would want nothing less. Have you felt that way? Have you felt that way? That when sometimes we keep on procrastinating, let me tell you, when we are on the other side, we say, why didn't I do this sooner? Have you said that before? Why didn't I try this sooner? Why didn't give God a chance in our marriage? Why didn't give God a chance in my, my addiction? Why? Why? My friends, God is a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love. He's waiting with open arms. He's saying, come. Come home. Come home. The gospel really starts in Genesis 3 when the fall of man happened and all that kind of stuff there, the mess that they created, you know, it happened. But let me tell you, this beautiful gospel has been unfolded and continues to reach out even today. So the question is for you, whether you are far from God or I don't know where you are, let's apply it now. Let's apply it. So that's what these three questions are. How do I view God? How's your view of God? Do you regard him as the only one God? The one who calls the shots in your life? Because why? Because he commands it, he deserves it, because you love him, and because it's best for you, right? Or maybe you need to work through something like that. How about this other one? How obedient am I being to God right now? Ooh, that one hit home just the other day for me. As I was preparing this, I said, okay, God, I'm going to stay the course because it's so easy to throw the towel, isn't it? How many of you would confess with me? It's so easy to say, okay, that, enough. Enough is enough. I'm just going to, that's it. That's it. I had it. Have you heard that one? I had it. We say it with an arrogance, like, ah. But when it's God, you stay the course. You endure. Pastor Duane was already challenging us with this um, Three, time, talent, and treasures. I will not spend too much time, but let me just say that life is precious. I just did a memorial service here recently for a 68-year-old saint. He lived well. He had a wonderful life. But let me tell you, life like this, in the blink of an eye, 
you can be gone. You and I can be gone. Life is done. So how much, how precious, how are we living our lives in light of who God is and what he's doing in our lives? And what he wants you to do, I should say better. What about your talent? You know that personality traits and passions that you have, they are unique to you. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Those personality traits, those gifts, those passions are particular to you. Only you. Only you. Your fingerprints. Oh, my goodness. I got to research a little bit on fingerprints with my sister-in-law. She's a wonderful pianist. She plays so much the piano that her fingerprints were starting to fade off. I didn't know that could happen. But do you know that they are so unique, like a Christian comedian says, your thumb body. You get that one? Oh, boy. I know it's late. We're hungry, so let's move on. Thumb body here. Thumb body. You are somebody. God has gifted you with something very special. I love this, this quote. I just found it the other day. Actually, it was Rich Mullins that was saying, and I had to research as to what. The place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the deepest hunger meet. Deepest joy, deepest need in the world, where they intersect, that's your calling. You will do anything for that. You will do anything for that. Your deepest joy and your deep, the deepest need, if we are obedient. We may miss it. You may be thinking, oh, no wonder I don't enjoy my job. Daniel, you don't really know my job is really a drag. Let me tell you. Maybe you need to quit the job and go and do what God wants you to do. Now, a disclaimer, don't blame me about that and don't, don't come in because <laughs> I don't want to have in trouble. But, but you get what I'm saying. How about your treasure? Let's move on to the treasure. Oh, boy, he's going to ask for money. No. You know, we, we have a faithful God. Remember that we said that? I know Pastor Dwayne has said that we are about 30,000 behind. Last year, it was such a good year for Woodland. Right, Pastor? To the point, Dwayne, that, that he's, he encouraged his stewardship team, hey, we're going to go more, we're going to do more for God. And that, that should be our attitude because he's trying to see how much he can entrust us. Right? Some of you are not convinced because I don't, I don't see a nod. <laughs> not that many nods there. Yeah, sometimes we have to stretch ourselves. And that's the reason why our budget was a little bit extra because we wanted to do more things for the Lord. I believe Woodland will come through. Why? Because we have a wonderful God who will reveal himself and he will shed light in our material possessions and say, you see how much I have blessed you? If every church member, every place, every person that calls this their home, this church their home, would give a portion of their giving, we will not have to worry about finances. We will be doing more, sending more missionaries, more mission teams, more stuff here. I, knew there'd be, I know that WFA needs another building in the back there, right by the, by the field. We can endeavor in greater things for the Lord. I'm serious. To reach this community, like, like Dwayne was saying, right here. That's what Pastor Tim says. Every day matters. Every day is a great day to love God, to love people, and to do something about it. How, is it look, how does that look for Woodland? I don't know. We're already doing it. We're trying to figure it out as we go. But God wants to do great endeavors, great things for his kingdom. No Woodland's kingdom, no Pastor Tim's kingdom. He'll tell you that first. But the kingdom of God. Amen? So only one life, look at this. We'll wrap up with this. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Isn't that the truth? So the question is right now, either now or later today, I'm serious, don't put it off. That's what they tell you to do an invitation, a call to action immediately after because you'll forget about it and then you'll, you'll, you'll just not do it. What changes and actions do I need to make in order to experience the blessed life God, God promises? And that poem that I just read finishes like this. Look at this. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Let's spend ourselves on the Lord. Amen? Spend ourselves on the Lord. Yes. As a matter of fact, who wrote that was C.T. Studd, Charles Thomas Studd, S-T-U-S-D-D, was a British missionary. He was born into a wealthy family. You can check him out. He had privileges that many of us wouldn't dream of. 
but he did not stay in the comforts of his privileges and his wealth. He actually went to, to China as one of the pioneers with Hudson Taylor. Some of you know that missionary, the pioneer missionary. There are Christians in China because of Hudson Taylor and this city stud. He went into India and Africa. He found that in, in 1913, the, the World Evangelization Crusade, which is still doing missionary work today, he died in the mission field in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. He spent his life for his Savior. Now, you may not have to do it to that degree. You may not have to go to way out there, you know, too far. How about here? How about just serving a woodland? How about impacting the life of a child or a youth or serving in the worship team or going on a mission trip or whatever it is that God is maybe serving. We have a great group of servants here who go and feed the homeless. People that don't have privileges like we do. And they go on the umbrella of women and men and all that kind of stuff. And then the food pantry we have. But you know, if we will have more people, it will be, it will be so much joy. You know the truth that they say about 20% of the people do 80% of the work? It's true. <laughs> and I don't say that with joy. I say that with a great sense of conviction that we need to enroll more people. Why? Because we, you are depriving yourselves. We are depriving ourselves of the joy of serving Jesus and making an impact that will be for eternity. I know I've gone long, but that's what I only do once a year, so don't worry about it. Remember the story of Abraham and Isaac? God provided a lamb for Isaac. Remember? There's another story on another mountain called Calvary where a father willingly gave his son. His name is Jesus. He came, God in the flesh, live a perfect life, sinless life. Oh, and he willingly went all the way to the cross for you and for me. To pay for our sins penalty, to satisfy the wrath of God upon sinful people because God and sin don't mix well, so he had to provide the way. And he did in Jesus. He was buried. At the third day, he rose from the dead. We just sang that in the song King of Kings, Right? And he's sitting at right, the right hand of the Father interceding for us. One day he's going to come back. He's going to pick up his children, his church, and we will be with the Lord forever. Are you part of that bunch? Are you part of the church? Today may be your day. I'm serious. Never take for granted that, they, that these are all saved people, converted people, believers. We believe that there are people here who are still checking this Jesus thing out. And that's okay. I'm glad that you're here. But I want to encourage you. Today may be your day of salvation. Will you please consider as we sing, as the worship team sings this song. And I'm serious. I will not be long. Two minutes. If we just take a look at those questions that I asked. How are you viewing God? Are you being obedient to Him? What actions do you need to take? Will you please send an added to a prayer, everybody? Please bow your head, eyes closed. Let's begin singing. Let us worship him. you need prayer, there are people here ready to pray with you.
Let us join in song, everybody. I worship you. Present yourself before the Lord today. You're the one I love. You're the one I choose. I worship you. If you would like to talk to someone, there is an area here called Journey Begins. I'll be hanging out around there even after everybody has left because sometimes people don't want to get there right away. Like, whoa, you know, what people are going to think. That's all right. We'll be hanging out there for a while. If God moves you to talk to somebody, pray with somebody. Just dedicate your life to the Lord. Say, hey, I, I just need to talk to somebody. You're not committing per se, but you're committing more importantly before God Almighty. I want to encourage you. If you need to speak about giving your life for G to Jesus, it will be our joy. Anybody here, our staff, myself, or I know we have wonderful servants in the Jordan Begins. I know it's gone late, so let's pray. Father, we commit to you this message. We believe that it was from you, Lord. I'm just simply your messenger. Father, will you please look at each heart and their eagerness, their desire to please you, to live for you, to worship you, to present ourselves to you. You're the one. I long. You're the one I adore. You're the one I choose. That's the prayer of each heart, Lord, that just chooses to do that. So will you please look at each heart here today. Be pleased with it. And that we will not only be um, listeners of this word and good intentions, but we will now go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. For the sake of your kingdom and your glory, God's people say, Amen. God bless you. It was great to have you here. Pastor Tim will be back next week. So we look forward to what he will do, okay, and, and share with us next week. God bless you.